Jason Squizero, a professional hand weaver located in Newberry, Vermont. My business, The Burroughs Garrett, specializes in historic reproductions and textiles inspired by the past woven using tools and techniques from the 18th and 19th centuries. Since we can't be together in person today, I thought this was a great opportunity to virtually welcome you here to the garret of my 19th century farmhouse and to show you and talk a little bit about this loom, which is the newest loom to come to me and probably my favorite right now, although don't tell the other ones. Um, I don't want to get them jealous. <clears throat> Um, I'll talk about it as sort of two different uh, pieces of equipment, uh, because there really are, that have been sort of married together here. The first part is the loom itself. This large wooden loom here is a classic English-style four-post loom of the kind that was used um, in New England, but also throughout uh, much of America from the 17th through the 19th centuries. This particular loom came from Shelton, Connecticut, and it has some unusual joinery, and finish uh, details that suggest that it was made quite early. Um, I would say that it probably dates to before 1750 and could even be as early as the late 17th century. Like a lot of looms that I have seen that were built and used around Long Island Sound, this loom is extremely long. It has a large depth between the breast beam and the warp beam, and that made this particular loom really an ideal candidate for the type of figured work that I use it for today. The other um, half of this marriage is this device up here. This is a um, jacquard machine or jacquard head that was built in Scotland around 1860. Um, it's an incredible machine. It um, is one of, if not the oldest, operational jacquard machines that is privately owned in North America today. Um, if anyone out there watching knows of one of a similar age or um, an older vintage, um, I would love for you to reach out and contact me and let me know. I would love to know more about it. Um, <clears throat> this loom is set up currently for weaving uh, a type of figured coverlet that was popular in the first half of the 19th century. And uh, if you're familiar with American coverlets, you maybe are familiar with float work coverlets, what we call overshot nowadays. And those are what we call geometric coverlets. Those use a small number of blocks, usually four blocks, in their designs to create their patterns. This machine, however, allows me to weave these figured style coverlets, which as you can see are much more complex and involve more curvilinear form. In order to do that, I actually have this loom set up much like a draw loom. Uh, is used. I work on this loom with double harness, but instead of having a draw system, either a shaft draw system or a single unit draw mechanism, instead I have the jacquard head set up for controlling the figure harness. In front of the figure harness, worked by the loom itself, uh, independent of the jacquard, are four ground shafts that control both my ground warp, which is what is creating the overall design on this coverlet, and a second um, tying or binding warp for weaving this particular type of fabric. So I've now climbed up on top of this loom so we can get a closer look at the jacquard head. This jacquard head is a 500 hook jacquard head, which means that there are 500 wire hooks that are mounted vertically inside the machine. Each hook sits over a bar or like a blade of metal called a knife. Lower down inside the machine, controlling each hook, is a horizontal wire called a cross wire. That horizontal wire has a little loop that wraps around the stem of the vertical hook. One end of that cross wire sticks out of something called the needle board. And so for each hook, there is one cross wire and one needle. So 500 hooks, 500 cross wires, 500 needles that stick out the back. Now, while we're here, let's just take a quick look right at the top of the machine, here are the 10 knives that run side to side through the machine. Each one controls um, 50 hooks that sit uh, over it. You can see that some of these hooks, which are these guys here, just lifted one out, some of them are sitting over the knife and some of them are sitting off of the knife. The hooks in their neutral position with the cross wires and the needles at rest all sit on top of the knife. However, if I push the needle, it'll push the cross wire against a spring on the other side of it, 
and it will actually push that uh, hook off of the knife. To determine which uh, hooks are going to be on the knife and which ones are going to be off the knife, this machine reads punch cards. And I will try to show you those here. Those are sitting behind me. And right here, here we go, <laughs> is what's called the cylinder. This is a four-sided wooden cylinder that corresponds to the needle board. So the face of the cylinder that's up right now is carrying the next punch card in the design. And you can see that there are a series of holes that are open and a lots of sections of card that are not open. When the cylinder is brought against the needle board, which is right here, you can actually barely see those cross wires sticking out right there. When that is brought against, when the cylinder is brought against the needle board, any place where there's a hole allows the needle to remain neutral. The needle stays put and the card uh, with the hole just passes right over it, no change. If the card is solid though, it will hit the end of that needle and push it, pushing the cross wire, pushing the hook off of the knife. When the knife, uh, or the knives in this case, are raised up when I treadle the jacquard machine, any of those hooks that corresponded to a hole in the card stay over the knife and they get picked up and lifted. Any of the hooks that uh, corresponded to a solid section of card, they were pushed off of the knife and so they remain lowered. They don't get picked up at all by the knife. Those are going to be the warp ends uh, that will control the warp ends that will be at the bottom of the shed and the ones that were on the knife are the ones that are going to be at the top of our shed. Now let's go down below and see what that does. So starting up here with the machine, as we come down you can see the bottom of the wire hooks it makes a loop and tied off to each one of those loops is one of these leashes, these harness cords here. These harness cords then come down and are passed through the comber board which runs horizontally across the width of our warp here. There are holes that keep every harness cord in its proper order and sets the density of the warp. Down below the comber board, over here, the leashes are tied off onto heddles. Uh, traditionally, these are often males that are made using a metal eye and loops of cord top and bottom. You'll recognize these probably as just standard nylon Texolve. And the bottom of that um, heddle or male has a weight on it called the lingo and that keeps our warp line in its lowered position when it's at rest. Um, the jacquard, the figure mechanism here, actually works as a stationary bottom shed rising top shed type loom. The ground harness in front of it though is counterbalance and has a counter shedding uh, motion to it. You'll notice though that there is a set of warp that is at rest um, in uh, a direct line from the warp beam to the breast beam and that is our tying warp. And you'll notice actually here that it's not being controlled at all by the figure harness. It's, uh, its individual ends actually pass between each heddle that comes off of the figure harness, uh, which controls a pair of heavier white cotton ground ends. As we move forward to the ground harness, this is actually a compound harness. We have two sets of shafts with ordinary heddles in them, and that's what the fine tying warp passes through. In front of them, though, each pair of heavy ground ends that are controlled by the jacquard are actually divided up between two shafts of long-eyed heddles here. So if you're familiar with draw loom work, these heddles are probably the ones that you're used to working with. Um, you could weave this weave structure on a, an ordinary draw loom. Um, it's a tied double cloth. Um, you might be familiar with it as tied biter bond uh, today. So let's take a look at uh, how the weaving progresses. So similar to the way a draw loom works, the weaving sequence here is kind of a two-step operation. For every row of pattern that I weave, I begin by treadling open the jacquard. This treadle is different than the other ones in that it has a cleat actually attached to the floor that allows me to lock it and hold the jacquard mechanism open. Right now that I've treadled that, uh, you can hopefully see 
but there are groups of the heavy white cotton ground uh, wart that have now been lifted up. These are the individual blocks that are going to make up um, my design for this row. So the first step, now that this has been opened, is to open up the tying warp. So I treadle that, and half of those ends have come up. I then pass through this shed the heavy wool um, figure filler here. This is the, the contrasting color <clears throat> that makes up this design. And then I treadle open the ground harness in front that controls the heavy white um, cotton ends, and this actually creates a plain view shed also. And I pass a finer cotton tying filler through this shed. Beat that into place. <clears throat> and then I drop and close the card, and then raise it, and it will lift up the next group of ends uh, that are required for this row pattern. So again, I now treadle the tying warp open, uh, this time to the opposite shed than I had the last time. Send the wool weft through. Keep that in place. I then try to open my ground harness here that controls the heavy white um, warp. That then allows me to pass the tying weft through. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, drawloom work, you'll notice that there is a cross shed happening now between the long eyed heddles and the figure heddles in the back. So now that that is complete, I. Repeat again.